When you think about it, what kinds of things are Christians most likely to disagree about? Well, Christians disagree about the Lord's Supper. They disagree about baptism. They disagree about the way they worship, formally or informally, and when, what day they worship. What version of the Bible should we use? Can Christians drink alcohol or not? Well, I think you get the point. Christians disagree about some things, don't they? So tell me, are those issues important? Well, yeah, sure they are. Should they divide Christians, uh, separate them the way they do? And I guess it would be good to clarify what we mean by divide and separate. I mean, there are levels of that, right? Well, part two of our Discover the Word podcast called Why Can't We All Just Get Along is about ready to begin. And so pull your chair up to the table and be part of the group. And welcome to Discover the Word, the small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries. I'm Brian Hedinga, and waiting at the table for you to pull your chair up to the table with them are four of the regular members of this Bible study group, Mark Dehan, Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, and Daniel Ryan Day. And as I mentioned, the group is going to continue a series of conversations called, Why Can't We All Just Get Along? And it is based in the last few chapters of Paul's New Testament letter to the Romans. And we're going to find that Romans chapter 14 is such a key passage when it comes to this issue of unity and diversity and disagreement among followers of Christ. Because, I mean, there are tens of thousands of denominations of Christian churches, churches that have decided that some of the things that we disagree about are worth breaking away from the group that they were with. And so let's listen as Elisa gets part two of this Why Can't We All Just Get Along series underway on the Discover the Word podcast. There are so many differences in all of the different kinds of denominations for followers of Christ, and yet all of them really do say they follow Christ and they love him. But what things come to mind that are some of the differences? Baptism, Uh or the way we practice uh, the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper. Good, good. There's lots of kinds of baptism. Yeah, there's infant baptism, there's sprinkling, Uh there's pouring, Right. And then there's dunking. There's dunking. And different kinds of dunking. Yes. <laughs> forward, backward. Three times face forward <laughs> yeah. and different things. Yeah. Right. And so. sincerely held beliefs based in scripture for yeah. each one of those right. persuasions. Yeah. With a lot of history. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And for a lot of one. church tradition. That's and right. And a lot of pain. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of to pain. To step out on their yes. own. Yes. Yeah. So there's that. And then there's, Daniel, you mentioned the Eucharist or mm-hmm. the Lord's Supper. The form of the worship itself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, Degrees of liturgy or no liturgy, mm-hmm. free right. form, no form. Styles of music. Yeah. Church calendar. Yeah. yeah. But taking that out of the denominations, there are similar differences in the lifestyle permission of those who follow Christ. Yeah, codes of conduct, right? Codes of conduct. Mm-hmm. Like what comes to mind there? Well, when I first became a follower of Christ, I was at a Bible college. The guys had to have their hair cut so short that it wasn't touching your ear if you had sideburns, they could only go to the middle of the ear. Were those called white walls? or White walls all around yes. is what they were we called. We were on a tire on a car yeah. in the 50s or whatever. Yeah. yeah, so they put it on your head for guys. Um, you had to wear a necktie everywhere you went. No pants mm-hmm. for women yeah. outside of certain specific mm-hmm. things. And, so, the, and the skirts for women had to be a certain length. Yeah, the skirts yeah. had to be below right. the knee or something. Yeah. Daniel? Head coverings sometimes. Good. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or maybe what? Beverages somebody could drink or yeah. not drink. Dancing or not. <laughs> In movies. Okay, dig a little bit deeper. What kinds of wrestling issues do we deal with today that might be controversial? Can you think of a couple? Oh, yeah, there's, generationally, there's, mm-hmm. I think, many more young people today, the use of alcohol, right? the, the drinking mm-hmm. of beer. You know, and in some circles, that was just entirely something we didn't do at all. Yeah, mm-hmm. and now it's yeah. m- much more embraced. Mm-hmm. I think of the subject of divorce. Mm-hmm. And that's still very painful, of course, and all these things have been painful. But in some congregations, that's mm-hmm. not even an issue. In other congregations, it remains an issue. Mm-hmm. So I'm bringing all these up, not just to make us uncomfortable, because I know <laughs> yeah, I've accomplished that. that. Thank you. <laughs> My heart's beating faster. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also bringing them up because as we continue our conversations in Romans 12 to 15, Can't we all just get along? We're looking at how Paul has taken the theology that he laid out Mm -hmm. in the first 11 and a half chapters of the book and is helping 
New Testament first century Christians apply it into their lives. And we come today to a section that's so familiar to us, and yet we still wrestle with. It's Romans 14, 1 to 9. And we call it, quote, the weak and the strong. You know, that's the way we look at it. The weaker brother and the stronger brother. But even people on the outside might have a difficult time even understanding why weaker, why stronger. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't sound like an ethical type of reference. It doesn't. It's like, are you a, you know, wimpy kind of person? I don't understand this. It's not physical we're talking about. Let's remind ourselves of the context Mm. of what's going on in the book of Romans. Paul is writing to a place he's actually never been to see these people before. But what else has happened in this body of believers, which are several different churches that he's writing to? Yeah, well, I was thinking as we were describing how we always see the other as the one who's weaker. You know, we had discussed how there's two groups of people that have come back together. Two and, groups of believers. Yeah, yeah. and so the in Jewish Rome. Christians mm-hmm. yeah. in Rome had been pushed out of Rome. and By the emperor, Claudius. By the emperor, yeah. yep. And uh, a few years went by where they were separated fully, and then these Jewish Christians were allowed to come back into Rome and rejoin the Roman church. And so you have these Gentile Christians and these Jewish Christians back Mm -hmm, together, mm -hmm. and Paul is encouraging them on how to interact. So that's the context that we're writing to now. Let's read Romans 14, 1 to 9, and listen, what is weak and what is strong, and what can we learn from this for today for us? Do you want to start, Mart? Okay, accept other believers who are weak in faith, and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not, and the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. In the same way, some think one day is more holy than another day, while others think that every day is alike. You should each be fully convinced that whichever day you choose is acceptable. Those who observe the day observe it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. Mm -hmm. For none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and rose again for this very purpose, to be Lord, both of the living and of the dead. So the principle I want to bring out before us is the concept of be accepting. That's what we want to take away. We've been looking at different B's, kind of joking about B attitudes. This is the way we're going to be in order to get along with people who are different from us. And we covered many last week. We covered be transformed. Wise. Be wise. Be gifted. Be gifted. Submissive. And be loving. That's right. And so today we're looking at be accepting, and we're really looking at the weak and the strong. And in what way is Paul writing about weakness? Mm. And it seems like he's targeting the Jewish believers who are coming in because they're the ones who have the most issues with food. They're the ones who have the Sabbath day and where they're going to do that. So lifting one day above the rest. So it seems as though Paul is going to them and saying, listen, you have all of these things, but don't think you've got a corner on the market of spirituality because you have those things. Hmm. It's interesting that Paul's writing this letter from Corinth and in his letters to the Corinthians, he talks a lot about food sacrificed to idols. And he talks about how some people don't have any problem eating meat that has been sacrificed to idols because they don't believe in idols. Mm -hmm. So no big deal. Other people just super, super sacred to them. They would never go Mm -hmm. there. Maybe that was in his mind. Yeah. Yeah, The other thing that's so interesting is I'm quite sure the Jewish people who had the law and who had all of these rules about what to eat and what not to eat must have thought of themselves as the strong ones. Exactly. And yet as they started reading this letter, it's kind of like, wait a minute, Paul, is he calling us weak? Well, even the way it starts out when he says, accept the one whose faith is weak, in my translation, the NIV says, without quarreling over disputable matters. Yeah, and there's a term that I heard growing up, and it was the essentials versus the non-essentials. What are the essentials of faith that I really do need to plant a flag and say, this is what I believe? 
and what are the non-essentials? And sometimes that line is really blurry between mm-hmm. the two. Yeah, and in this case, it's really blurry for the Jewish people because yeah. the line had changed. The essentials yeah. and the non-essentials, it, it reversed. Changed. That had yeah. been revolutionized by right. the cross. Yes. So the whole thing got turned upside down. And now those who maybe came with the presupposition of strength are finding out, wait a minute, I'm the one who's on the wrong side of the fence here. Right. And now the community Mm -hmm. is saying Mm -hmm. that what we said was the absolute essential Mm -hmm. as the means by which we have a relationship with God doesn't even give us a relationship with God. Mm. Everything's turned upside down. I mean, that's what Jesus did. And Paul's trying to, after he's set out the tenets of the faith, the essentials of what really matters, that we're saved by faith and, you know, we're sinful, etc. And the whole process that he set out in the book now is like, how do we act it out? There's a surprise in that, too. Mm -hmm. Because grace is such a surprise, he continues to surprise us. There's language in this text about servants. Who are you to judge someone else's servant in verse 4? To their own master's servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. This language is a house servant. It's Mm -hmm. a domestic servant. But Jesus came to change our understanding of service, didn't Mm -hmm. he? He changed everything about it in such a way that, let's go to verse 8 and understand We don't belong to the old law. We don't belong to the old Mm -hmm. order. Daniel, what does verse 8 say? If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. We belong to the Lord. Yeah, And what I see in this is that Paul is trying to get both groups to come to that common ground, which is that both groups ultimately are trying to honor the Lord. They're trying to give thanks to the Lord. We see that in verse 6, where it says that this group that observes this day, they're honoring the Lord. This group that thinks it's another day, they're also trying to honor the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so the common ground that's created, you know, the series is called Let's All Get Along. It seems like the common ground that Paul's trying to bring them back to is, look, at the end of the day, both of you are still pursuing a relationship with and to live with God. Mm -hmm. For all our differences, if we share a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, then we do have a lot in common. Be accepting, the be attitude that the group focused on there from Romans chapter 14. This is such an important chapter in shaping how we think about unity, even with all the diversity there is among followers of Christ. And as I mentioned in this series, we have had a be attitude for each one of the segments. Like in part one, be transformed, be gifted, be loving, be submissive, be wise. And the B to start part two, be accepting. Well, the next B they find in Romans 14 is kind of related to that. I'm sure that no one listening wants to be labeled as judgmental, right? And yet, is it possible to go through life without having to make any judgment calls on anything? And so when is that your job to judge, and when is it not your job? Well, let's listen as Elisa and Mart and Bill and Daniel broach a sensitive subject, that of judgmentalism. What does it mean to be judgmental? Well, just the word itself feels negative. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are positive ways you could think about judging, like judging a contest or judging a sporting event. But judgmental seems Mm -hmm. to carry darker overtones. I think the difficult part comes when you're looking at someone and implying they're bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not only is what you're doing bad, but you're just plain wrong. Yeah. And the coloring of the action is attributed to the character of the person. I think you're right, Mark, because, I mean, I drive with my mouth. (laughs) My wife is constantly challenging me. What did you say you drive with? I drive with my mouth. I don't get it. I'm very verbal while I'm driving a car. It's not his teeth on the (laughs) steering wheel. (laughs) And my verbal usually is directed at those driving around me. And my wife's really challenged me on this over the years, especially when kids or grandkids have been in the car, that you might hate what something does, but you don't say, I hate people who do that. Hmm. Okay. There's a difference between those things. So you're suggesting, and I think this is where you were going, Mart, is that when we go into a person's character that they're bad, that's a really ugly part of judgment. To the greatest degree, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hear my friends that say things like, don't judge me. Don't say I'm bad. Yeah, don't say I'm bad or what I'm doing shows that I have some kind of desire to do things that are bad. Hmm. Boy, we hear that a lot. Don't judge me. Yeah, that's interesting. Now you're going to motive and intent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
we're continuing our conversation about can't we all just get along? And we're in a very, I would want to say thick and chewy <laughs> chapter in scripture. It's Romans 14, the weak and the strong. And uh, yesterday we looked at one of the next B's that Paul is encouraging us towards, and it's be accepting. So it's a positive. But as we continue discussion in this chapter, we find something we don't want to be, be not judgmental. And they're different. Being accepting is different than be not judgmental. And that's where I want to take us. This is a context where different kinds of Christians are living together. You have Gentile Christians and you have Jewish Mm -hmm. Christians. They've been separated for some five years. The Jewish Christians sent away by the Roman authorities, and now they're come back together. And Paul's laid out theology in the first part of the book of Romans, and now he's helping this group of believers in several different churches in Rome apply them and how they live together. And we come to this concept of be not judgmental. What does that mean? It also comes right on the heels of our conversation last time of how there's Christians that believe one thing and other Christians that believe something else. And Paul is not saying that either one of them are wrong, but instead that they're being focused on things that he doesn't consider to be as essential. And they need to come to that common ground Mm -hmm. where they realize, hey, we're all pursuing the same God. Mm -hmm. We're all looking to honor God and to give thanks to him and to live for him. And so even the context of our conversation today comes right on the heels of, it's okay to have some differing beliefs on some of these things, as long as we remember that we all come from that same foundation of relationship with Christ. And I think now, even as Daniel, you were just expressing this, it came into such focus for me. It sounded like you're saying, and I believe it's right, what is essential is that our desire be to trust the Lord, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to please him. I don't normally think that that's the essential. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. yeah, our desire to please yeah. him. Our we desire make to non-essentials. Him. Yeah, essential. When right. That's the essential and that goes piece. to the motive. That goes to the heart yeah. issue. It's the prayer of the monk. Lord, I don't always know what you want me to do, but I think the fact that I want to please you pleases yeah. you. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yes. Yeah. Well, think about even where we started this whole series by the mercies of God and some of the other translations that we read said in view of God's mercy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so even that it's where our eyes are focused. Our eyes aren't focused on these individual things that we might disagree on. Our eyes are focused on the fact that Christ has shown us mercy. And because of that, it's out of that mercy that we can even begin to have these conversations Mm -hmm. of what maybe we do disagree on, but that's okay. That is key, Daniel. That is key. So let's bring that forward as we read this passage. The focus is on, what did you say? That God has shown who mercy? Me mercy and you mercy. Me mercy. Yes, and you mercy. So let's read Romans 14. This is a bit of a long passage, Romans 14. 10 to 21, and we'll just go around it, but listen for the words judge in here. There are a couple of kinds of judge and judgment, and what are we to learn from it? Do you want to start, Daniel, since you've got it right there? Yeah. So this is Romans chapter 14, verse 10. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Okay, so right here in these first couple of verses, we're seeing different kinds of judgment. In verse 10, you see, you then, why do you judge your brother or your sister, in my version, why do you treat them with contempt? What kind of judge is that? In the NLT, It says, so why do you condemn another? Yeah, it's really evaluating and looking down on them. That's what Paul's talking about because he goes on and he says, for we will all stand before God's judgment seat. What kind of judgment is that? Yeah, so that would be like condemning in a legal sense, um, which the word that we talked about earlier to pass judgment is that same concept. So you have the idea. It's actually a really cool picture because Mm -hmm. all of us, have experience with either seeing a courtroom or being in a courtroom. And so that's kind of what Paul's describing there is the judge is sitting in his seat and we are not that person. God is that person who's Mm -hmm. in the seat. And it's not right for us to be the one to try to condemn in a legal way like a judge would. Okay, so that's the point here. You know, God's role is the judgment role in the end to decide where we are and what's happened in our lives. But let's remember what we've been saying. He's a merciful God. 
I mean, we stand before a yeah. loving God. And he's the only yeah. one who has right. that mercy who yeah. can then incorporate it. And isn't it true that in that sense, as a judge, he won't just be there to condemn. No. He will be there to discern. That term was also used at the athletic games. When someone would win a race, they would go before the bema to receive their prize. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there was a positive context to it in another yeah. sense. So really staying in these first couple of verses here, why do you judge your brother or sister? It's not your role. You don't need to look down on people. God, the only merciful God, is the one who can truly sit in the seat of judgment. With complete understanding. Complete. So we start off with that, and then he goes into this series of verses that we may not take the time to read all right now about stop passing judgment on one another in verse 13. Instead, make up your mind not to put a stumbling block or an obstacle in the way. And he goes into what you're eating, etc., on and on. But I think in the first verse, he's made the point that we don't need to put ourselves in the role of judge. Mm -hmm. God alone can be in that role. And I think what Mart said is really key there. God has complete understanding. He has the whole picture. You know, a lot of times we'll run into people in our lives that are, they seem nasty. Mm -hmm. You know, they seem like they're against us or against others or whatever. And it's hard for us to remember that they probably have a story going on in the background that we know nothing about. Mm -hmm. And the reason that they're acting that way today is because of something that happened earlier in the day. And so, you know, God has that complete perspective. He saw what happened earlier in the day. He knows why they're having such a difficult time and why they're taking that out on us, even though we're not the ones that deserve it. And I think, you know, where we're going with this is to find higher ground. Yeah. Where's the higher ground as we deal with differences between us? And in verse 19, mm-hmm. later in this text, mm-hmm. Paul gives us a little bit of a blueprint. He said, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace mm. and to mutual edification. I just think that's what the mercies of God have offered to us. To right? use Daniel's illustration, you know, when we run into somebody who's obviously not mm-hmm. a nice person, <laughs> can we be kind? Can we be the light in their day? Can we be a messenger of hope and of forgiveness and love? Can we be not judgmental? Can we be accepting? These two really go together. They really Mm -hmm. do. Can we be the difference knowing that God's got this? I don't need to stand in God's role. He's Mm -hmm. got this. And because the mercies he's shown to me, I can show that mercy to others. Yeah, that's a great point that in so much of life, it is not our job to be judge. God's got that covered. So the beatitude from Romans 14 from that segment is not to be judgmental. You're listening to the Discover the Word podcast, and you're at the table with Mark DeHaan, Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, and Daniel Ryan Day. And they're going to talk about the wisdom of knowing when to speak and when not to speak, and the role that has in answering the question, why can't we all just get along after this short break? Well, especially following a global pandemic that forced us into isolation from each other, many of us have experienced loneliness in a new way, something that we've all had bouts with before, but in so many ways, this took it to a whole nother level. But the truth is, even when you most feel like it, you are not alone. And Elise has written a book called You Are Not Alone, Six Affirmations from a Loving God. She did a lot of research on how difficult loneliness is for a surprising number of us for so many different reasons. And I think you'll find how she speaks into this really will be helpful and encouraging. And because you enjoy studying with Elisa and the group here on Discover the Word, I think this is a book that you'll find encouraging and really helpful in those times when you're feeling this distance from God and distance in your connections with others. So order your copy of Elisa's book, You Are Not Alone, Six Affirmations from a Loving God. When you go online to discovertheword.org, we have a link there on our website this week. Or just search for You Are Not Alone by Elisa Morgan in any of the online booksellers. And now back to the conversation and another B attitude from Romans 14 that can promote unity in the body of Christ. B, quiet. Have you heard of the homogeneous unit principle, sometimes pronounced homogeneous unit principle? We usually get 2% in our house. (laughs) (laughs) I knew I could count on you, Mark. Homogeneous, is that 
a bunch of people who are all smart in the same way? Or just alike. Oh, okay. I think it's that like attracts like, okay. bottom line. Isn't that a lot easier to say? Yeah, so it's like the word homo genus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The mm-hmm. scientific genus of people or a species, and so you have same genus. So now you're just Does that sound off. right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing. That's what I'm yeah, asking. Yeah, he's he's got his phone out. It's I just know. birds of a feather. Yeah, flock, flock together. together. That's there you go. the idea, right? That's the Why idea. Why didn't you just say that? Because I wanted to sound smart too. Me and Daniel have <laughs> been working on this. So. No, it's, some of your friends are probably their followers of Fox News or CNN News. Maybe they read the NIV or they read the NKJV. I mean, we kind of hang together. But the principle of the homogeneous unit is that we tend to stick with people who are like us. Hmm. And if we are around people who aren't like us, We often want to convince them to be like us. Mm. Or we become like them. That happens more rarely. (laughs) (laughs) That happens more rarely. Yeah, because the whole idea, as far as I think what's going on in our own heads with that, is we want to be affirmed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That we're on the right track. Mm -hmm. We want to be affirmed that, yeah, I've got this, and I know I've got this, because look at all the people that agree with me. So I must be right. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the dark side of it, isn't it? Yeah. It is, you know, because we want to be reinforced and we want to be comfortable. We want to live in neighborhoods with people who are like us. We want to go to schools with people who are like us. We want to go to worship service with people who are like us. We can get stuck. We can get really stuck. So that's the dark side. Mm -hmm. But there's a really natural part of this as well. The last several days we've been having conversations. And what's our topic? Let's just orient ourselves again. Can't we all just get along? Mm -hmm. And the reason we can't is because we are not, the human race, a homogeneous unit. We're not. We're yeah. hugely diverse. And yet we are all made of the same blood. I mean, the scriptures make it clear that there is a sameness mm-hmm. to us, right? Mm-hmm. True. Yeah, and in the context of this passage, Paul's trying to get two separate groups of people to remember that they worship the same God because it's two groups of Christians a group of Jewish Christians, a group of Gentile Christians. They've been brought back together after a season of being apart. And so Paul's trying to do what we should try to do as well, which is to help people realize we're worshiping the same God. This is Jesus who died for us. We live by his mercy. Yeah, when you bring it back into Romans 14, where we've been the last couple of days anyway, those of us within the body of Christ have more reason than anyone I mean, it's one thing to say in the culture, well, some like CNN, some like Fox. You say potato, I say patata, you know, like within the body of Christ, we have more to agree on in Christ. And more that's essential to agree on. The bottom line, which is what Paul's been spelling out in the first 12 chapters of the book of Romans, are those tenets of our faith. And then what we've been looking at are the last several chapters of this book of Romans, 12 to 15 or so. How can we get along? If this is what we believe in, yet there's so many differences, how can we get along? Yeah. Some of the B's we've talked about, let's just quickly go through. And we've talked about it begins with be transformed by the mercies of God, by the mercies I've received. You know, I need to be transformed so that who I am in relationship with others is different because I belong to Jesus. What other B's did we acknowledge? Well, we talked about be submissive and how we relate to authority. Okay. Be wise in our thinking mm-hmm. and our relationship to God and others. Be not judgmental. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. We had a lot of challenge getting through that and also thinking about the opposite, be accepting. Mm-hmm. And we're coming today to, I think, another surprising challenge that Paul gives, and it's to be quiet. Ooh. To be quiet. I don't know if I like this one. I know. And there's an application. Be quiet in the face of people who maybe do things differently than you. So let's read these words and let's try and figure out what does this mean for us? We're looking at Romans 14, just a couple of verses here, 22 to 23. Bill, do you want to start us? Sure. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But those who have doubts are condemned if they eat because they do not act from faith, for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. Okay, so this is following the text that we've been looking at the last couple of days. Be accepting, be non-judgmental, because you belong to God and because you let God be the judge. That's sort of the conclusions we came to. And so the last part of this section of scripture is hearkening back to 
eating and worshiping and all the different ways you act that out. So that's the these things. That's the these things mm-hmm. here. And the reason it says condemned if they eat, it kind of sounds like that comes out of nowhere when you just talk about those two verses, but they've right. had this whole conversation about this group feels that certain foods are okay, this group feels that those certain foods they shouldn't eat. So that's what's coming in there Thank too. you. And thanks for setting that context. So let's go in specifically to verse 22 then. Mark, what does that say again? Verse 22 says, you may believe that there's nothing wrong with what you're doing, but keep it between yourself and God. Blessed are those who don't feel guilty for doing something they've decided is right. What does this mean? Okay. Is there a sense in which this could be seen as being hypocritical? Because well, I know you don't like this, but I'm going to do it. But I'm not going to tell you about it, but I'm going to act like we're okay hmm. when actually I'm doing something I know you don't approve of. That's interesting. Maybe, but I also hear the voice of my mentor who is much older than I am, which is why I like to spend time with him. One of the things that he's said many times is that the older he gets, the less he knows. Mm-hmm. And what he means by that is realizing that within our faith, there are so many different things that we might not see exactly eye to eye on and that being okay and realizing like, do I really need to get my opinion in on this conversation or by being quiet, am I actually showing love to this person or respect? Respect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, is this really something I need to weigh in on Mm -hmm. or is this something that I can just sit back and be quiet about? Yeah. What I'm hearing the two of you now seems really important. The question is, are we being hypocritical? And I think your answer is it determined in your heart. I mean, what you mm-hmm. just described was a heart that's wrestling to be true to its God mm-hmm. and to oneself. And that may be true of all these bees that we're talking about. Mm-hmm. It all depends on the motive. Yeah. And Paul keeps bringing us back to, do you belong to God? Do you trust God to be the judge? You know, are you secure in your relationship with God? I mean, we could take those B's of be accepting and be non-judgmental. Instead of pointing our fingers at others, what if we gently pointed our finger at ourselves? What if Paul is saying, really, God doesn't want you to be judgmental of yourself, Elisa? Mm -hmm. God will judge you in the end. Can you be merciful to yourself? Can you receive the mercy that God's given you? God wants you to accept yourself and bear with the weaknesses in you, Elisa. I mean, we can turn these around if we really understand the relationship, the way God's changing us and transforming us. And again, the motive there is why would you not want to be judgmental on yourself? Would it be to justify what you're doing wrong? You can do it with a right or a wrong motive. Great point. Yeah. But we tend to, (laughs) I think, do it more to take God's place in our lives or in the lives of others rather than to belong to God the way we do. Mm. So be quiet. To me, I think it boils down to when Paul says, keep your views between yourself and God. Can we learn to live with the tension that every single element of the Christian faith is not mapped out in Scripture? Oh, how we wish it was. Can we allow ourselves and others the freedom to journey over a lifetime, Daniel, as you just said with your mentor story, to coming to understand how we're to be and to give people the respect and the permission and the freedom that they have in Christ to live and discover it for themselves. I love the word you use. You use the word tension. And, you know, we don't like tension. We like to resolve tension. But so much of Scripture is tension where we don't have all of the answers to all the questions that we want. Mm -hmm. And so... That's not easy for me to do, to live in tension. Yeah, I don't think it's easy for any of us to do. And we do feel compelled to weigh in because we do think we're right. Mm -hmm. And we think, well, I'm going to fix them. Mm -hmm. And it's not our job to fix them. That's God's job to fix them. And Paul's offering this instruction at the end of a long discourse about dealing with the weaker and the stronger brother, about people who are eating meat sacrificed with idols, about not judging, about accepting. And it's kind of a conclusive, almost like a selah to go to the Psalms, a Mm -hmm. pause of, can you be quiet and keep these things between you and God? When I do that and sit with my views with God, there is a kind of settling. The tension is still there, and I experience it, but there is a kind of settling that comes over me, and I'm less quick to react, and I'm more mindful of the relationship I hold with Him, and my responsibility and where it stops, and God's overall responsibility. It's a boundary issue almost. In our church, 
our pews are covered in different colors of fabric. You know, they're like a green and a blue and a purple. And my pastor, Robert, did that intentionally because he wanted to represent the diversity in our body and that we're all come together as one. I've never seen that before. Anywhere. No, I haven't either. But I think it's a really important idea because hmm. sometimes we assume that uniformity means unity. And those are two very different ideas. You might have everybody gathered who looks the same way and acts the same way. That doesn't mean we're together. Exactly. And in our church, we have different races. Of course, we have different languages. We have different ages and genders, but we also have different denominational backgrounds that have come together, and it's an interdenominational church. So it makes me think every time I come into it that I'm a part of something bigger. Which we are. Mm-hmm. You know, we're a part of the bigger church, not just there, but throughout the whole world. And we also have flags hung up, and many churches do this too, (laughs) of all the nations where our congregation members have gone and served or visited or learned or however it's been rich. But we're continuing in Paul's letter to the Romans, and just that we've only been focusing on several chapters, 12 to 15. Bring us just a bit of a summary, because today we're going to come to another principle, and it's the principle of being one, being united, not necessarily uniform, but being together. So what are we learning so far? Yeah, I think your emphasis has been on how can we all get along for the right reason, right? Right. And what's the right reason? Well, the right reason is to please and represent the God who has shown mercy to us. And realizing that even if we might have difference here or there in what we believe, what we're saying is, as Christians, we have the same foundation, We believe in Jesus, the fact that he died for us, and that through his death we have life, and that we are called to lay down our lives for others. Yes, he has accepted us, as he has helped us, so we now are to accept one another in his love for his purposes. And I think in the very first conversation we had, it was on Be Transformed, and I think we we all kind of realized that unless we're being (laughs) transformed, We can't do any of this. Mm. This is really what transformation looks like. I mean, we're kind of bookending the whole concept here. What Paul's encouraging this group of Gentile and Jewish believers to do is to allow Jesus to do the transformative work to make them one. Yeah, but it can't be forced either. I think that's one of the things we've seen over and over again. Yeah, You can't just demand it, command it, force it, control it. Fake it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it's tricky for us because we see this as bad math because Paul's whole point is that one plus one equals one, right? You have (laughs) the Gentile Christians, the Jewish Christians, two groups, Mm -hmm. and yet they're one group, just like marriage, where you have two people that are separate becoming one. One plus one equals one. (laughs) (laughs) We're looking at a couple of verses today. Romans 15 verses one to four. Let's start there. I'll start. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. Such things were written in the scriptures long ago to teach us. And the scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. He doesn't really use the word love, but he is this applied love. He uses the example of Jesus, that he submitted himself, that he took it on himself. And that's who we're supposed to follow after. And then he goes on to offer this instruction about being one, being together, how we get along with each other. So if we could turn our attention now to verses 5 through 12, we're going to hear some specific nationalities in here. We're going to hear some race comments. Listen for them and how Paul is calling them to unity. Verse 5, Mart. May God, who gives this patience and encouragement, help you live in complete harmony with each other as is fitting for followers of Christ. And then all of you can join together with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. And now before we get on into the racist pieces that I was talking about, I want to underline here this goal of harmony. I loved your translation, Mart. Mine is the same attitude of mind toward each other, but yours was the word harmony mm-hmm. and one voice, one mind. And then Daniel, your translation of welcoming one another, that is really what that word accept that we talked about the other day really means. It's not like put up with or tolerate. 
It's welcome, mm-hmm. welcome one another, which is a great openness and entreaty to learn from you, to embrace you, to receive from you. So we've got this, I want to call it belly up posture that God's called us to with one another. And now comes more conversation. Listen for the different nations here in verses 8 and down to 12. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the circumcised on behalf of the truth of God, in order that he might confirm the promises given to the patriarchs, and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, Therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles, I will sing the praises of your name. Again it says, Rejoice you Gentiles with his people. Mm. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him, the Gentiles will hope. Okay, what do you hear here? After he's had this very vulnerable, entreaty, loving Mm -hmm. opening, what is his support for? You know, what he's doing is he's driving this thing home. I mean, he's going to the Old Testament. But again, we've seen a bunch of times throughout these conversations that Paul's writing to a divided church and the division has been both in terms of time over a period of years that the Jewish believers were separated from Rome and the Gentile believers were functioning on their own. And now they're coming back together. And once again, he's using the Jewish scriptures to remind the Jewish element that the Gentiles are part of this too. Yeah, God's heart is for the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And we need to remember that in Romans 11, he talks a lot about the Gentiles being grafted into the vines of the Jewish believers. Mm -hmm. This is a continuing, he's holding both heritages together. I think, wow, and he says your attitude needs to be the same as who in verse five and six there. As fitting for followers of Christ Jesus, right? Right. And he became a servant of the Jews. And back up in the beginning of chapter 15, he also didn't please himself, but the insults of those Mm -hmm. who insult you have fallen on Jesus. I mean, it's amazing what he's doing, layering this diversity into a union. Yeah, and I think it's tough sometimes for us to think of these two groups of people because Mm -hmm. I don't know about you all, but I don't have a lot of experience with Jewish Christians in the community that I live in, there's just that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. There's not a big population of Jewish Christians and I'm interacting with them trying to figure out how we mesh. You know, what I see in our community is Christians with very different perspectives on politics Mm -hmm. or Christians that have a different skin color and things like that. So I think, you know, as we look at this story where we see two groups of people that at this time were separated, not even by their own choice, the government stepped in and separated them, and they're being brought together. For us to understand what that really means, we have to think of our own churches and what are the groups of people that God is bringing together that we struggle to see eye to eye with. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's uh, refugee congregations. Maybe it's those who experienced spiritual giftings and have different views of spiritual giftings. It can involve people at other ends of the economic spectrum. People who have a lot and those who have nothing. Yeah, because all of the things that you guys have just been describing were in Rome. (laughs) I mean, it was the most cosmopolitan city in the world. And the church there was a reflection of that. And so all of these different differences. Yeah are part of what Paul's appealing to in the general categories of there's the Gentiles and there's the Jews. But even within that, there was a lot of differences. And he's encouraging these people who mainly see themselves as different because of their cultural expressions, how they live, what they eat, what they do with their time, which days are sacred. He's trying to bring them together in their differences, not to abandon their differences, but to welcome their differences. Because as you said, Mart, Jesus died for the world. The world then and the world now. And there's so much more to do to continue to welcome every single human being into the body where they can find belonging because of the faith we can share in the one God and his son, Jesus Christ. Yeah, we learned some of that new math there in that part of the conversation that one plus one equals one. We're talking about unity in the body of Christ, unity even in all the diversity that there is in the church. And we will wrap up this study based in Paul's New Testament letter to the Romans in just a moment. But first, let's see where the group will be going in our next podcast. Next time on the Discover the Word podcast, Daniel is going to lead the group. 
and some conversations about the pressure that we feel, whether it be from others or from ourselves, to be better than others, to succeed more than them, to be, well, to be great. We live in a world where we're obsessed with whether it's being unique or standing out or accomplishing great things, becoming an expert, making an impact, having it all together, getting the promotion. We desire these things. We desire to be great. And what I'm hoping is that by talking about greatness and hearing Jesus' invitation to discover what true greatness looks like, I think by the end, we will feel a weight lifted from our shoulders, at least until we try to put the weight back on again. Yeah, who is the greatest? That's our next study on the Discover the Word podcast. And now let's conclude this conversation about unity in the church called, Why Can't We All Just Get Along? I think it's encouraged us to be more characterized by unity than by division, by getting along rather than focusing on our differences recognizing that certainly there is diversity, but that doesn't mean there can't be unity. But has this podcast been about promoting a blind tolerance of everyone and everything that says, you know, everything's okay? Is this a unity and peace at all costs where getting along is the highest and only value that we need to be concerned about? Well, an important concluding perspective to our Why Can't We All Just Get Along series is next. You know, Lisa, you've been leading us through these conversations on can't we all just get along? And the whole time, because you may or may not know that I have a fondness for the Beatles. Why? Uh, yeah, I see you're stunned. Um, <laughs> the Beatles did a song called We Can Work It Out, which sounds very much like it does. Can't we get along? But the lyrics show why we have trouble working it out. It says, try to see it my way. Do I have to keep on talking till I can't go on? When I see it your way, we run the risk of knowing that our love may soon be gone. We can work it out. But the implication is, if you'll agree with me. (laughs) And that's really our core motivation. Let's make everybody think the way I think, right? (laughs) And that's why our conversation two programs ago, we don't like because it says that we're supposed to be quiet. And instead, we like to be verbose and get people to think Mm -hmm. the way that we think or to agree with us. And Paul actually challenges us in this section to be quiet. Yeah. But for the right reason, right? Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, be quiet because you're afraid to say or stand up or be counted. Timid. But Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Self-protective. Yeah, right. But you can also, as you indicate, be quiet out of consideration for the faith of another person. As we conclude our conversation of can't we all just get along It's hard to stop because we haven't fixed anything, but we have come to some really clear understandings. We've been looking in Romans. What is Paul doing in Romans and what are we noticing as we approach this topic? Paul's building a way of life based on the foundations of what Christ has done for the world. And it's for all peoples Mm -hmm. everywhere. But his unique context is to Christian believers in the city of Rome in the first century. There was a group of Jewish Christians, a group of Gentile Christians, and they're having a hard time getting along because they see things differently. And Paul's trying to help them, as we looked at last time, become one. Mm -hmm. And you know what? You brought us straight to it, Daniel, when you said talking about Jewish believers and Gentile believers is remote from Mm -hmm. us today. But when we think about in our churches, there are people who maybe have a different view of baptism or they have a different view of politics. You know, then all of a sudden it comes home and we go, oh, I get it. And we've been through these B attitudes, if you will, kind of a new version of them. And as we come to the conclusion today, I want to leave us with one that's another unifying attitude. It's be trusting. And it's the way Paul ends this section. And I think it's so important because it's really hard to believe (laughs) that these attitudes can really work. And we have to add a deep trust that God is at work in each of our lives in order to hang in there Mm -hmm. and let him do that work. Just to quickly review these be attitudes that we've talked about. We talked about it begins with being transformed. Yeah. And why was that important, Bill? Because that's the platform for everything else. I mean, just as we have to trust God that he's working, we also have to be dependent upon his work in us if any of this is going to happen. Mm. 
as much as is possible within us, as he says. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, mm-hmm. presenting your bodies as a living mm-hmm. sacrifice, acceptable and honoring to God. Mm-hmm. That's where it starts, individual, but also the body of Christ. Yeah, and in the same way that a butterfly goes through a metamorphosis of going from a caterpillar to a butterfly, we are going through that process of losing an old identity and coming into a new identity in Christ as believers. Yeah, I think we talked about be gifted with the idea of use what God has given you for the good of one another. Mm -hmm. And your gift may not be the same as mine. In fact, it's not supposed to be. (laughs) And so we need to really embrace that. And when we see those differences that we need to be loving. Uh Um, (laughs) And that often includes understanding and embracing our own need for each other. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. what helps me turn towards accepting you. And then a kind of a submission. Again, for the right reason, not just mm-hmm. to be submissive, but for the good of one another. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and also as it relates to how we engage the culture, how we engage the government, the authorities that surround us, that's a part of that submissiveness too. Which can be very difficult. Mm-hmm. And so we understand we have a citizenship different from this world, but we're still going to honor and respect Then we went into being wise, which is really understanding the purpose of the law, but that Jesus has conquered the law and we're freed from it. And then we looked at a cluster of these characteristics, be accepting and non-judgmental and quiet and one. And those had kind of pokey areas in them, didn't Mm -hmm. they? We all got stuck on a couple Mm of elements. Well, I think they raised this whole issue of tolerance. You know, when we say, well, why can't we just all get along? Yeah. And I think that there's this underlying sense, but we've got to be true. We've got to maintain, we've got to protect the truth and defend the truth and have the courage to stand up for what is morally right. I think that underlying tension caused us to feel uncomfortable with the idea of, well, let's just all get along or let's be tolerant of one another. How do we solve that? Because being accepting is important. Being non-judgmental is vital. Being quiet is great at times. But where's the command to go out and stand up and fight for God's causes? Well, I think maybe if you go back one step further, just before the be accepting, the be attitude is to be wise. Whatever this is and whatever it's going to look like, it's going to require wisdom beyond ourselves. We're going to have to apply and learn and trust Mm -hmm. God's wisdom so that we can discern when it's time to stand for truth and when it's time to accept and be tolerant. And, and those and times... What, yeah, and what is it that transforms us? Yeah. Is it standing up and telling someone else they're wrong? Yeah. Or is it sharing a consideration for one another, caring for one another in a way that calls attention to what Christ has done for us? I heard a radio program one time with a guest named Christopher Yuan. And in that, he described that unconditional love does not mean unconditional acceptance of behavior. And that always stuck with me because it goes to that tolerance idea of, you know, we talked about being loving. We talked about these two different groups of people and how they have different ideas. We talked about the essentials versus the non-essentials throughout this series. And it comes back to that idea, if we're going to truly be loving, it doesn't mean that we have to accept everything. Do you mean by that affirm and encourage everything? Correct. Because there's a sense in which we have to accept and tolerate the behavior of other people, right? Mm-hmm. Live alongside. We have to live alongside, mm-hmm. and we can't yeah. try to control them and legislate, legislate or forbid them. But we can stop short of encouraging their behavior while loving and accepting them unconditionally. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think so. And where that comes from, the verse that we still haven't read yet <laughs> for this section, but it's in Romans fifteen thirteen. Let's read it, Daniel. Which is where Good we're point. going. This is the conclusion <laughs> yeah. for our conversation. Where are we now? We're it's in Romans 15, verse 13. 13. And I'll read it since I brought it up. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. And the reason I said that I think it comes down to this is because, you know, this isn't the only time that Paul talks about being filled in Ephesians he talks about being filled as well. And in there he talks about being filled with the fullness of God. And my prayer has been, God, fill me so much with you that it overflows so that other people see you Mm. and don't Mm. see me. And I think that's where we get to what you're talking about. How do we live around people that maybe have different ideas? We're so filled with the fullness of God that it's overflowing from us so that we can find that balance. Yeah. It's influence, isn't it? It's lifting them up for their good. 
And the focus is not on them and if they're wrong and where they're wrong. Yeah. The focus is on me and my relationship with God. Yeah. And I'm constantly going, Ugh, am I embracing the transformation God is doing? Am I embracing the giftingness that God has brought to me? Am I being loving? Am I yielding? Am I accepting? It's about me. And when I'm in right relationship with God, what's going to overflow yeah. is that rightness with other people in a loving relationship. You know, we have a tendency to suffer from biblical amnesia. We live in this terrible time and this awful time, and there's never been another time like this time. The people Paul's writing to in first century Rome, they were sorting out the same kind of stuff Mm -hmm. in their churches and in relationship to their culture that we're still wrestling with today. And I think, to your point in bringing us to this verse in verse 13, the power of the Holy Spirit Mm -hmm. is the non-negotiable must have absolutely or else we're going to continue to flounder and misrepresent the heart of our god to the world Mm. the niv reads this is may the god of hope fill you with all joy which is a delight and confidence in god and peace which is not the absence of conflict but is the presence of god as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, this is God's deal. Our deal is to yield. Our deal is to be a part of it. Our deal is to be accountable to ourselves and to God and to bring ourselves that He might do His work in us, the transformation. And then from it, it overflows into everyone around us and through us into our world. And hopefully when they see us, they'll want what we have and find out that what we have is the God who has us. Balancing tolerance and standing for the truth and putting the principles of Romans into action. You've been listening to the Discover the Word podcast with Marty Hahn, Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, and Daniel Ryan Day, studying the last few chapters of Romans together and exploring why can't we all just get along? Well, Discover the Word is a small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries in Grand Rapids, Michigan in which we invite you to walk with us through topics and passages that inform the way we read the scriptures, that challenge us as we live our lives as followers of Christ, and always point us to discover Jesus in the pages of the Bible. And here at Discover the Word and Our Daily Bread Ministries, thanks to the generous support of friends like you, we're able to help men and women from all walks of life to experience a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, to grow to be more like Him, and to serve Him in a local church family. Our Daily Bread Ministries is a global ministry with staff and volunteers in over 35 offices around the world, working together to distribute 60 million resources every year to people in 150 different countries. And I would invite you to support us in that mission by giving a one-time gift or by giving a recurring monthly gift as a Discover the Word partner. Explore which option is best for you when you click on the Donate button at discovertheword.org. Well, thanks for listening. I'm Brian Hedinga. The Discover the Word podcast is provided by Our Daily Bread Ministries. 